Hello. In this clip from our Just You webinar, Inclusivity Unlocked, Engaging with People with Disabilities in the Workplace, Christina Wegg explores the situation of disabilities in the U.S. within the legal industry. If you'd like to see more Justia videos on law practice and legal marketing, be sure to subscribe to our channel. So with that, the first thing I'm going to hit on is those three topics that I just mentioned that we're going to talk about. And the reason why I kind of talk about them in these three buckets is because it's important to me when I talk to somebody about engaging with someone with disabilities, I get some interesting responses back. And it's important to fully understand what we're talking about here. Sometimes when I say, oh, did you do X, Y, and Z? I'm told, yeah, but we're not legally required to do that under American Disabilities Act or some other regulation. Well, that's not necessarily what I'm talking about of being professional, of which we'll talk a little bit about in a few moments. It's a component of being professional, making sure that you're not breaking the law. But if that's the bare minimum of what we need to do to interact with people with disabilities, I think we're failing. So what I want to point out is you have these three buckets of areas that we're going to talk about today, but there's overlap. That's why the circles are overlapping there. Um, sometimes you will have an issue that is completely ethical and professional. Sometimes you'll have an issue that's actually ethical, professional, and has some legal requirements or what have you. To give it, you a, a concrete example of this, let's look at a violation of the American with Disabilities Act, which we'll get into more. So you have a legal requirement if you are um, an attorney and your client asks you for an accommodation for an ASL interpreter um, because they're deaf and you fail to provide that. That would be a violation of a regulation or an act or a rule. So there's a legal requirement. But you also have an overlap with the fact that your violation, a model rule professional conduct related to the duty to properly communicate with the client. And then you also are not practicing inclusion, diversity, equity, and belonging. So that's an example where all three of those overlap. Whereas let's give you the example of a bar session decides to put on a CLE program and nobody has asked for accommodations for captioning to be turned on. The program has the ability for captioning to be turned on, but nobody did it, right? So we move forward to give the presentation. This would not be considered necessarily a violation of ADA or law because nobody asked for the accommodation, but it certainly doesn't encompass the idea of occlusion, diversity, equity, and belonging, which emphasizes the ability to provide accessible communication, right? So that's an example where the only bubble that would really be involved with that issue is inclusion, diversity, equity, and belonging perspective. There's no ethical issue um, as far as breaking of codes, professional codes, and no legal requirements that were violated. So the first thing I want to bring out there is what is a disability, right? Let's start a basic conversation about that is because that's another misconception that I encounter quite a bit. Usually when I ask this question, especially amongst lawyers, I get rattled off the definition of disabilities under America's Disabilities Act, which is utilized for enforcing that specific regulation and rules. But it actually depends on what context we're in as to what a disability means. But let's talk a little bit about that. Here's some examples. The first definition up here is just a general, you know, Wikipedia or encyclopedia definition of disability. A physical, mental, cognitive, or development condition that impairs, interferes with, or limits a person's ability to engage in certain tasks or actions or participate in typical daily activities and interactions. Pretty vanilla basic definition of disabilities. Whereas what I was just talking about, um, ADA, American Disabilities Act, has a very specific legal definition that has to be met in order for the uh, requirements to apply to you. So under ADA, it defines a person with a disability as a person who has physical or mental impairment that substantially limits one or more major life activity. And this can include people who have a record of such an impairment, even though they don't currently have it. It can also include individuals who don't have a disability, but are uh, perceived of having a disability. And it also includes um, 
the unlawful discrimination against a person based on a person's association with another person that has a disability. So while it's somewhat broad, there are some key terms in there that have been litigated and um, further defined through case law that makes it a very specific definition. So uh, my favorite definition, though, personally, actually comes from a journal of ethics, AMA Journal of Ethics, um, in an article called Perspectives on the Meanings of Disability. And it really hit home when I read this because this is kind of what I've experienced as someone with a disability. Disability is a term of art with different specialized meanings, each developed for the particular policy or programs that uses it. How we conceptualize disability shifts relative to the methodologies used to learn about it and the context in which it is addressed. The criteria for judging people to be disabled likewise fluctuates over time and across different social and cultural contexts. So the reason why I bring this out is, like I said, usually people want to apply the definition of ADA um, whenever someone is self-identifying as someone with a disability. So let's say your company is sending out a form to self-identify for one of their diversity inclusion initiatives where you can check the box and um, you can check that you have a disability or you identify as an attorney with a disability. Some forms I have seen for this purpose of, of inclusion and diversity will define disability underneath of it and include the ADA language. It would be appropriate to include that if you were asking if the individual was requesting accommodations under ADA and applying the rule to that situation. It is inappropriate to include the definition of ADA requirement to meet disability when you're asking somebody to self-identify under diversity and inclusion. And so to put this in more perspective, if someone were to check the box that they self-identify as being African-American, we don't put parameters on how somebody self-identifies. We don't request that individual to do a DNA analysis to determine if they actually have origins um, and relatives that come from Africa. The same concept applies. If someone is self-identifying for diversity purposes that they have a disability, we should not be requesting proof um, or for them to further explain why they identify as such, especially applying a um, regulatory definition to that. So with that, I just want to hit on the fact uh, that the disability realm is so diverse, it's extraordinary, honestly. Um, the types of disabilities that you had, they can be broad, they can be defined cognitive, physical, mental health, learning disabilities, or it can be very narrow to a specific diagnosis such as blindness, anxiety, Down syndrome. You can look at it from a perspective of personal experience to the lens of a person with disabilities. We talked about the, the, the definition of disabilities changes based on context and the individual. It wasn't but maybe three years ago that I eventually um, decided to self-identify as being disabled. Even though I've had this um, diagnosis for a good seven, eight years at least, um, I didn't self-identify or feel comfortable identifying as someone with a disability until just a couple of years ago. And how you became a person with a disability, whether you were born versus acquired later in life, may impact um, your views as a person with disability. And then there's all obviously differences between those with disabilities by race, ethnicity, gender, sexuality, and economic and social class, and education and values as well. To put it in perspective, uh, I was reading an article about predicting how to predict votes for certain subsets of voters, whether that be African American voters, women, etc. And the article emphasized the fact that it was next to impossible to predict the vote from those with disability simply due to diversity within the subset of individuals. So you can see stereotyping individuals with disabilities is just not appropriate. Let me give you an example. I can talk to somebody who has the exact same disability I have, but they have a very different perspective because they were literally born with it versus me who had adult onset. So born, born versus acquired. The first thing I noticed when I became friends with several individuals who were deaf their entire life was how they took all the challenges in stride because it's the only thing they had ever known. While me, I noticed I was more outraged and concerned about certain interactions that I was encountering, um, especially during COVID with mask covering of how 
frustrating that was to try to function in everyday life when I wasn't able to lip read. I spoke to my friends that were deaf and, and they were like, well, yeah, Christina, what did you expect? Like, this is what it's been like forever. So it's very interesting how your perspective on that can change as well. So let's talk a little bit about numbers. Let's talk about disabilities in the U.S. in general. Statistics on disabilities are very difficult to collect for a number of reasons that we'll talk about, one of which is um, how you define disabilities that we talk about. Each study or individual who's collecting these statistics might define disability differently. And so you can see how the numbers would change if the definition of disability were changed. You also have an issue with it wasn't until recently in a lot of workplaces that employers were even collecting information and uh, metrics about their employers, um, employees, sorry, that may have a disability. And then you also have the issue of it's very challenging when the um, subset of individuals uh, with disabilities may be cautious or not want to self-identify for purposes that we'll talk about. So the numbers are always difficult to really drill down on. But uh, based on the Bureau of Labor Statistics and CDC numbers currently, up to one in four adults, that's 27 percent of the U.S., has some type of disability. Based on 2023 data, half of persons with a disability were age 65 or older. That means half of them are actually quite young. A common misconception when we think about you either born with a disability or you don't get a disability until you're older. Uh, unemployment rates were much higher for people with a disability than for those with no disabilities. And workers with a disability were nearly twice as likely to work part-time as workers with no disability. And employed persons with a disability were more likely to be self-employed than those with no disability. Now, drilling down on this a little bit more from a legal profession standpoint, um, this some of these numbers are actually from a 2015 article by BWB Solutions that was entitled People with Disabilities in the Legal Profession, Understanding the Various Challenges and Opportunities to Improve Diversity. I haven't been able to find a more updated um, article that provides more updated numbers, but I still think this tells a story very interesting to me. So one thing that I started to investigate when I became an attorney with a disability in a large law firm was kind of looking at the landscape and like how lonely it was. I didn't have a lot of peers to have this discussion with. So, you know, if one in four of us in the United States have a disability, why is it so hard for me to talk to other attorneys that have disabilities or hearing impairments specifically? So let's look at this. The proportions of people with disabilities in the educational system declined steadily from secondary school through law school. So what's happening there? Not sure, um, but it calls in the question, is it an issue where people with disabilities aren't getting some of the higher education and is dropping out along the way? Or is it perhaps something where the institutions aren't collecting the data? Or is it because someone doesn't want to self-identify as they go further up the educational change as somebody with a disability? People with disabilities are less likely to graduate from four years institutions. People with disabilities are underrepresented in law school. I thought this was very interesting. Yet law schools have the highest prevalence of people with disabilities among graduate programs. And generally, people with disabilities who hold professional degrees, including law, are underemployed. Statistics vary, as I had mentioned, but it's estimated that as low as 3.5% of lawyers between the age of 18 and 64 have a disability or or are identifying as having a disability. Okay, one in four of Americans have some form of disability, and we've now gotten down to 3.5% of lawyers have disability. That's a pretty tiny number. And then I drilled down on it just a little bit more since I work in a law firm and started looking at some numbers within just law firms. And um, a good source for that is to look at the National Association of Law Placement Report on Diversity in the U.S. Law Firms. I looked at the most recent report for 2023, and these numbers are really tiny. But the percentage of partners self-reported as having a disability has grown by approximately one-third of a percentage point uh, to 1.41%. Okay, let's just call it. I'll give them 2%. Even 2% of individuals in uh, law firms are um, self-identifying as having a disability. Again, 
Is that because the metrics aren't being kept by the law firms? Or is that because the individual doesn't want to identify as having a disability? Or is it because simply people with disabilities typically don't work in large law firms? That question still remains out there. In 2023, percentage of associates of self-reporters having disability increased from 1.63% in 2022 to 2.44% in 2023. Again, uh, my take on it personally is that I think that we're seeing more people that are feeling welcome to self-identify um, in the workplace. And we're also seeing more employers who are actually collecting this data at law firms and submitting it. And at overall, 1.99% of all lawyers identify as having disability, which is up from previous years as well. Although the presence of individuals with disabilities among law students isn't precisely known for some of those challenges that I had mentioned, Research suggests that 6.2% of graduates self-identify as having a disability. So we have approximately 6% of attorneys coming out of law or out of uh, law school um, who are identifying as having disability, yet we only have less than 2% or so um, of attorneys and law firms that are um, identifying as having a disability. So there is definitely an area there where it appears, at least based on numbers, that we're losing individuals with disabilities um, from being employed in law firms. And it's difficult to conclude, as I'd mentioned, because the trends and numbers are so small, but one fourth of the offices included in this NDLE uh, study did not report data on lawyers uh, with disabilities. So that's another issue that's going on there. Um, I feel like it's the last frontier with diversity and inclusion initiatives, but um, many law firms are starting to keep data on individuals that are uh, neurodivergent, who have hearing disabilities, you know, just any sort of disabilities in general. And so what is going on here? You know, it could be some of the things that we had talked about, uh, like somebody doesn't feel comfortable um, identifying on a piece of paper, checking that box that they have a disability. Or it could be that some firms choose not to collect that information or some employers in general. But one thing we do need to be observant about is whether it's ableism that's going on. So ableism is a term, some of you may have heard this, some of you not, used to identify discrimination or social prejudice against people with disabilities or who are perceived to have disabilities. This can come from the form of ideas and assumptions, stereotypes, attitudes, practices, physical barriers in the environment, or large-scale oppression. Um, the reason why I said personal versus systematic, um, I often get the response of, oh, well, I'm very welcoming to individuals with a disability. I'm very accommodating. Anything I can do to help them. I suggested that your organization looked at your policies, your procedures, any systematic biases that might be ingrained there and become barriers for people with disabilities. So let me give you and I uh, just a couple examples of the differences there. So personal. Okay, you are hiring and, and the candidate has a disability. You, you choose not to hire that candidate because uh, you're concerned about liability. You're concerned about the cost to accommodate that individual. And you have concerns of whether they'd be able to do the job. That would be ableism on the personal level. Flip side to that is systematic. So an example of that I like to bring up is job qualification, right? You look at a job um, qualification hiring post, and it'll say the bare minimum is what you have to have. Um, I've seen some that have qualifications on there that really don't have any bearings on the job, but act as barriers to people with disabilities and applying. They may not apply for it because they don't feel they can meet the minimum qualifications. An example of that is you have a... Um, announcement that says you have to be able to um, pick up 50 pounds as an attorney. Okay. I can't remember the last time I needed to pick up 50 pounds in order to do my job as an attorney. But just having that in there, if someone has a disability that doesn't allow them to pick up 50 pounds, they're likely not going to apply for the job. Um, another example of systematic biases I like to point out is law firms. The question of whether the billable hour can be a systematic bias for some individuals. For instance, um, if you have ADHD or you're neurodivergent in some aspect that requires you to have more time to do your job, when you work at a law firm, you're often valued on every six minutes of time that you bill. Well, if it takes you longer to do the job, 
Will that negatively impact your job performance evaluation? Or will it cost the client more money to get the same product? And if it does, who bears that extra cost? Is that something that the firms try to pass on to the client? Or is that something the firm eats itself? And does that cause barriers to an individual with disability who may be neurodivergent that requires extra time in order to do their job? So those are kind of ideas um, and examples of what I'm talking about in regards to ableism. Thanks for watching. We hope you enjoyed this video. And if you did enjoy it, please click the like button and subscribe to our channel for more videos on law practice and legal marketing. See you in our next clip. Thank <laughs> you.